here we go. Mojo on the session. It's finally happened. What a background you have. All the diplomas, all the achievements. Look at you. How's it going? I'm great. I'm feeling good. I'm glad we finally got this thing going. We're here. We're here. We have arrived. We've got that mojo energy. Yes. Um, I don't really know where to start, so to speak, because when I was doing my research to get ready for this interview, like you're one of those people. And I'll say that this is not the first time that it struck me because it struck me also when I was doing commentary and doing research on people. You're a fascinating human being. You've done a lot of really crazy things and have like a ton of achievements. Um, I'll be kind of rattling some of those off, but like you're a huge overachiever. What's your deal? I think it all relates to my severe ADHD. I got to be doing <laughs> 10,000 things at once or I start to like twitch and spaz out. Uh, it's kind of how I seek peace of mind by doing so many things always. How do you unwind? What do you do when you chill out? Uh, I usually go on vacation. I feel like <laughs> I'm either even when I'm partying or resting, I'm I'm doing that part pretty big too. So oh the way gosh. I see it, if I'm on the home front, I'm working, I'm I'm setting up all these other things that I've been doing, and when we have a little break, we we go somewhere, see the world, and of course now I'm recently engaged, so yes. I have someone special to take trips with. Oh so that's God. very nice. Congratulations. I cannot wait to pick your brain about that. Don't worry. It's on my list. It's on my notes of things that we have to address. Obviously. I mean, what a huge deal. Um, you found the one you found the lady. I was starting to get worried that it wasn't going to happen, that I was going to get caught up in the mojo <laughs> lifestyle forever and i was gonna be alone at 69 years old and that's not what we want so okay let's just get into it how did you guys meet so this is actually a fun story because uh you know obviously spent the last 10 years wrestling on the road constantly partying doing the thing and uh i had a whole bunch of friends in the new england area that were always telling me about this girl. Oh, Gracie Tracy would be perfect for you guys would be a great match. So I didn't really think anything of it, but I would always, uh, you know, DM her or, or text her or something. Uh, when we were in town, she was living in Nashville at the time for the Nashville shows. And she was like, I am not going to respond to this guy who clearly just wants to party for the night, come to the show, go out to, to eat, go dancing afterwards, and then what? Like, there's no chance knows? I'm gonna be one of those girls. So she she was always very polite, like, oh, good to hear from you. Uh, yeah, let me check the calendar and see if we can make it. Always turned me down for years. So <laughs> I kind of respected that. <laughs> yes, of course she was like, listen, when you wanna actually get serious, maybe, but nobody just wants to be that in the town side chick. I definitely can't blame her <laughs> but pretty much one of my best friends married one of her best friends and uh we met at the wedding and then that was that we met in person that's all we needed she saw me on the dance floor so i was able God. to uh you know overwrite everything any other kind of impression she had of me before because as you know i'm a fantastic dancer i know this I've seen and it. then there you go we took it we took it pretty slow in the beginning very slowly but surely I was going through a lot of transitions work-wise, health-wise, uh, everything that I've been dealing with, starting the new company, and then kind of same thing with her on her end. But, uh, you know, things heated up pretty quick. She moved in like four or five months ago, got engaged. What's today? Yeah, oh, a week ago today. Week so ago, yeah. how about that? Oh, my gosh. So what was the moment for you when you're like she's the one I'm going to propose to her because I remember I saw you last summer and you were like she is the one I'm locked down this is it and here we are so what was that for me it was actually and I, I'm actually pretty it's pretty awesome to be able to say this but something just felt different from like the day I met her um just her personality her energy, the way she carried herself. Of course, I think she's a dime, so that helps too. <laughs> but uh, yeah, just something right away just felt different. You know, I was single for the past, shoot, 10, 11 years or no, longer than that, like 13, 14 years, something oh crazy. Wow. 
Wow. So, uh, you know, there wasn't too many close calls along that time, but right away from the start, this thing just felt different. And I kind of wanted to doubt it and give it its time and make sure this was the right fit. Cause you know, I always said my next girlfriend is going to be my wife. There's no question about it. What's the point of casually dating when you're in your mid thirties, if it's not going to work out, it's just sure. a waste of time for everyone sure. involved. So, uh, well, you know, um, that that's why we took it slow. And then eventually we got to the point where it was just like, you, you, we can't deny this anymore. We need to uh, get this moving with a hurry and everything's moved oh super fast. Gosh, so cool. How do you stay single for 13 to 14 years? Like that's crazy. How is that even possible? Well, probably because I was in a relationship for the 13, 14 years straight before that. <laughs> so that's okay. So wait, what is the deal with that? Because you were in a really long term relationship from when you were really young, right? This is all kind of jogging my memory. I forgot about this. Yeah, what <laughs> yeah, what happened? I was with my ex girlfriend. We started dating when we were eleven. We were in like seventh grade, I think. And, you know, we did like the, the kind of grade school thing where you break up 10,000 times and get right back together. But yeah. we were together all the way through shortly after my NFL career ended um, when I had that injury. So, uh, you know, on and off, I never partied. I never drank. I never went out. I didn't do any of these things. I was kind of still the same guy. I just instead of partying until the wee hours of the night, I was studying and doing my work and doing extra <laughs> workouts and conditioning with that time instead. So, um, which also was too much because I used to get hurt a lot because of it. But <laughs> I guess when I finally became single at like 23, 24, it was like, man, there is a whole nother fun world here that I can partake <laughs> in. I was not playing football at the time either. So I was like, wow, I have no excuse now to not go out and have fun. I don't have to wake up for a training session or have like a season to prepare for. Like, I got nothing right now. So yeah. let's let's go have some fun. And that's kind of when Mojo was born. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Like just how busy you have been for so long. Do you ever get burnt out or feel that way? Like, how do you recharge yourself? I know you said you go on vacation, but like, are there other things that you do to like maintain this energy? Um, at this point, I feel like that's just me. I've been living this lifestyle for so long. It's just, I'm used to it. I actually get more stressed out um, when I'm doing nothing. So yeah. when I had my, my lung injury, you know, from COVID, I spent like a year while I was still under contract with WWE, but I wasn't going into shows where I was recovering. Of course, with, with those contracts, we couldn't do any like third party business really. So I was literally sitting at home and I was like, I have nothing to do with my day and there's nothing I can really do to fill it up. I mean, I try to take like my Arabic classes and like kind of busy work like that, but there was no like mission I was working towards, no kind of end game I had in sight besides, you know, being able to breathe properly again, which was its own struggle. But yeah. that year sucked for so many different reasons. I just... Yeah. I've never had a time period in my life where I had nothing to do. And it, I, I hated it. It was awful. It's, it's such a weird feeling. Cause I can be like that too. As soon as I like, as soon as I have like a moment of downtime, it's nice for a second. And then I'm like, then I start, my wheels start spinning and I'm like, okay, now what about this thing and this thing and this thing? Like, as soon as I left WWE, um, I went down. So we finished, we did SummerSlam in Orlando. John and I had an Airbnb in Jacksonville cause he was doing TVs out of there. So I drove to Jacksonville. We got there and John's like, cool, just hang out, enjoy the week in Florida, do whatever you got to do. And I was so tense and I could not chill out because I was like, I didn't have my hand on another branch. So I didn't know what I was going to be doing. I just knew that my time there was done. So me not having my hand on another branch, that made me kind of spin out a little bit where I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? And he's like, can you relax i'm like i don't think i can yeah he didn't understand it's the time off is stressful <laughs> it is it really is um okay let's get into your covid issues um i feel i mean you just spoke about this not all that long ago you mentioned on your instagram um this was a huge thing for you this was a long-term battle 
that you had since having COVID? What, what all happened? Yeah. So pretty much I ended up getting it and, uh, I got rocked pretty hard by it. Um, the first few days were, weren't so bad. It was just kind of like the on and off kind of spotty fever kind of thing, like the chills and whatnot. I think like most people get it. And then I'm not sure what happened from there. Myself, the doctors, we have a couple of hunches, but things kind of spun out of control. My fever spiked to 104. I, I was overheating. Um, it was so crazy. I remember taking an ice cold shower, trying to get my body temp down. And like the freezing cold water would touch the top of my head. And by the time it got down to my neck, it was like boiling hot. Oh. I was like, that's crazy that just this amount of distance was causing water, freezing water to boil. So I went into the hospital. Uh, they checked me out. They took my temperature. They really didn't have anything for me to do but sit in a cold room by myself to, to bring my fever down. But after that, I just started developing... Um, this this cough and these breathing issues i was coughing so bad that the blood vessels in my eyes burst so like my eyes were bloodshot looked insane uh, of course as a wrestler the first thing i wanted to do was start taking pictures to I document know. it like we do um yeah. but yeah I, I just couldn't breathe i couldn't get a full breath in i'd get like these little half breaths where the air would kind of get to here and it would stop before it gets up to a place you can actually really get it in so um couldn't lay on my back couldn't lay on my side i couldn't wear t-shirts uh because it would suffocate me that extra pressure on my lungs was just awful uh, i had to like learn to sleep sitting forward in a chair which i already am like the world's worst sleeper um so these things certainly different didn't help i was like having to take like night quill and all these like melatonin and all all these sleep aids combined together just to kind of pass out just for a little bit but oh yeah certain days it got so bad I couldn't speak I just couldn't get enough air in to talk and it was like every breath for weeks months was an active process something that I had to actively do and it was it was scary because I kept seeing the doctors and everyone was like this is this is brand new we don't know what to tell you we, we don't know how to treat this uh, we can clearly see that you're your lungs are bad. I went to the pulmonologist one day and they put me in this little cubicle and I did like this, this breathing exam. And, um, I remember afterwards on the way into the pulmonologist, I saw like this 90 year old woman hobbling out on like a walker and the doctor goes, uh, Hey, did you by chance see that older woman that walked out when you got here? I was like, yeah. And she, he goes, uh, yeah, her lung, her lung strength is triple what yours is right now after this test. And I was like, oh, oh my, my goodness. Gosh. So it was literally over a year of going to the docs every couple of weeks, every month, them testing me, me failing miserably and just going back home. Like, I guess hopefully time will heal this and we'll, we'll go from there. Um, don't get me wrong. The kind of crazy part too was some days I felt more or less fine. The only time I would notice is if I worked out and I really tried to push it, then I could feel like I, I just can't get the air in like I used to. But yeah. that kind of was the frustrating part was I, I tried everything. You know, what was causing me to have good days and bad days? Was it working out too hard? Was it like some sort of congestion or allergies? And mm -hmm. we just, we still to this day have no idea. Like just sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad and no one can tell why mentally what was that like for you because I know I mean I had it obviously not to the degree that you had it but I had it and I had all the symptoms and you know all that stuff but I had it so early on that I remember like the mental warfare that went down where I was like I don't know what's happening nobody else really seems to know what's happening I never went to a doctor with mine I was just like at home kind of self-quarantining on like the upper level John was downstairs um, and just trying to make the most of it I and mean, using any kind of anti-inflammatory stuff that I could find. Uh, I found some stuff on like Amazon, these like other like breathing pills. I'm like, give me all of the stuff. But when you don't know what you need and nobody has the answers and it's all so new, but I mean, for you to have it with the severity that you did, what did that do to you mentally? Probably the scariest part for a little bit of this was 
um, when the breathing was bad, it was scary to go to sleep because I was worried that I might not wake up. You know, I might suffocate myself in my sleep, um, especially with how tired I was getting at points because I literally wasn't sleeping. Yeah. Um, you know, I was worried I was just going to pass out and that that might be it. You know, so there there was that fear for a little bit. Um, now thinking kind of professionally and about where my life was headed. It's like, all right, well, I've been with WWE for 10 years. We're doing mass firings left and right. Um, and you know, there seems to be not necessarily a rhyme or reason for it. Yeah. I got to get my ass back to work or else I'm going to be in the next group, you know, like I got to yeah. go back and prove my worth and show them why I should still have a contract. And I just was not in a position to, to do that. And then part of me too was like, I don't want to go back until I'm ready because if I go out there and my, my lungs give out in a match and I'm, I'm dragging it. And my whole thing is I stay hyped and I'm the hype man. I got all the energy. Now I'm the guy that gets blown, blown up, up by the time that. you got to the ring. Oh my God. Exactly. So I was like, I, I don't know what's better to, to try and go back with them knowing that I'm recovering just to do something or to wait until I'm a hundred and then get back to business as usual. I remember kind of pitching, Hey, what if I was someone's hype man, a manager role, a bodyguard, you know, commentary, announcing, anything shoot send me to the corporate office and let me use my business degrees and let yeah. me essentially do what I'm doing now for you guys but uh, you know and I, I agree with them on this it was we decided it was better to just stay home until I was ready what was the point of of rushing it and you know maybe making me worse or taking step back to uh yeah. you know try and take one step forward it just wasn't worth it so there was just kind of all these things going through my head and it was just like man I'm I don't know what to do I mean it's like I'm lost. I, I have no idea how to handle this. Did you go back at all before you guys parted ways? You and WWE parted ways? No. So my last match with Chad Gable uh, was my last time at work. Aside, I think, from maybe later that week going in for testing or, or something to that extent. That, that was it right then and there. Wow. Crazy. So, okay, so you had that downtime. I mean, you know, trying to figure out what you're going to do, get your body right, all those things. But you have been very busy. Now you've got a gig with TMZ. You've started the Paragon Talent Group. Shout out to Paragon. <laughs> hey! <laughs> um, how did everything come together with TMZ? TMZ was actually really funny. So, uh, truthfully, I've been going on TMZ here and there for years. And when they first called me, in the beginning, I was like, shoot, this is TMZ. This is big coverage. This is mainstream stuff. Hell yeah, of course I'll go on TMZ. After that, you know, every time, you know, they would call and maybe it was a situation where it was like, I'm a little worried to comment on this topic in case it gets me heat in the <laughs> locker room or with friends. Either way, I always said yes, because at that time, part of me was like, I think it's a better idea to be on a really good terms with TMZ in case, God forbid, something happens to me. They can control the narrative here a little bit better and, <laughs> and help me out. But they were always super respectful, super fun, made life very easy for me. I always got along with the host uh, when they would when they would call me up. So um, actually, right after my release, I, I got a call. TMZ was the first interview I did after after WWE. Um, Harvey Levin, you know, the founder called me and he was like, Hey, I'd love to chat about you coming to work for us. And I was like, Oh yeah, very interesting stuff. And he said, that's actually one of the reasons we've had you on over the years. It wasn't only just to hear your stories and have you talk about, you know, the, the headlines. It was kind of like an audition process. Cause we knew we wanted to hire you as soon as you became available. So I was oh, like, wow, awesome. that, that, yeah, that made me feel great. So yeah. Um, we did some stuff with them there. And then uh, I think, you know, Fox ended up buying TMZ, which just made things even better for everybody. So yeah, yeah that was just an easy, easy fit. I've been doing that every day. Um, having the time of my life with it. It's been, it's been awesome. And for me, you know, I kind of went in with the mission and this was actually probably one of our founding principles for, for Paragon, the talent group was this was kind of an opportunity to, have prof the world of professional wrestling have a regular seat and a regular feature on 
you know, mainstream news yeah. to mainstream audiences, which I think personally is something that we've really, really lost, you know, over the years and continue to lose by the year. So it was kind of like a two for one special. It all made sense. And yeah, it's been great. Hell yes. Okay. So Paragon, how did this idea come about that that was a thing that you wanted to launch and, uh, and bring on some really great talent? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, um, that was cool because one, you know, now that I was, uh, you know, available again, I was no longer under the, you know, the WWE contract. Now we can do all these third party deals and now we have complete control over the brands we work with, the deals that we negotiate. So I kind of selfishly broke open my Rolodex and was like, all right, time to go to work. We got to we got to pay the bills. You know, I don't have the salary coming in anymore. Um, and I kind of found this even while uh, I was with WWE when I was able to navigate these waters sometimes. But a lot of these brands want to work with just more than one person. They want to work with multiple people that are friends that can collaborate, that can put their heads together and market, you know, each other's deliverables. So that opportunity presented itself a little bit. Uh, and then, you know, just kind of getting a, a hold of all these people, uh, talking to all my friends that were recently released, seeing these people that were literally former champions with millions of followers, with immediately identifiable global brands, and they have no idea what to do next. And they don't know where their paycheck was. And some of them weren't on the main roster long enough to be able to afford like a little time off before they yeah. went back to work. They needed to find out where their next meal was coming from. So I had the brands looking for people. We, we had the talent that were looking for the brand. So it was like, shoot use this business degree I paid so much money for and kind of be the the conduit here so we called Steve K which is uh yes. one of my best friends he was the talent booker for the hard rock in, in Vegas and you know we kind of started this thing together and uh man it's been going great we signed like 30 people off the bat we wanted to start with 10 but I just couldn't say no to, <laughs> no, to right? any of my buddies <laughs> Yeah, that part's been a little stressful because it's like man I, we have all these people counting on us there's only two of us you know yeah. some of these deals take weeks and months to to set up it's like man we gotta we gotta be on this non-stop so we're taking 10 20 calls each and every oh, single yeah. day pitching people and you know it's been it has been kind of fun because these brands really have no idea what they're buying whatsoever they have no idea what professional wrestlers can bring to the table and why it's better to do business with our guys than NFL players and NBA players where they're just one of many on the team under a helmet, you know, that don't yeah. have their own brands and they don't know how to cut a promo and things like that. So yeah. it, it's just been great. It's taken off faster than we could have imagined. Oh and we've all been thrilled with how it's been going. Yeah. It's really cool. It's, it's just it, like, that's what I mean. Like terms of like the fascinating side of you is like, you do have this business degree. You're so smart. You're always looking for these new things to do. It's, it's really cool to see what you've been able to do with this time that is back to being yours. I mean, your time away from WWE to, to start building your own little empire. It's awesome. It's yeah. been fun. And the best part is we're all doing it together. So all the family, yeah. all the money stays in the family. We all keep it in our <laughs> pot. And it's uh, just fun to work with your buddies. It is the best. Um, why do you think that wrestling has kind of lost its touch uh, with the foothold of the mainstream media? You know, I don't know. I, I have a few ideas as to why this is. I mean, you know how it is. You ask any kind of, you know, maybe someone that's not like in the, the cult wrestling bubble, um, you know, when was, you know, do you watch wrestling? And everyone has the same answer I used to watch in the Attitude Era with Stone Cold and The Rock and all these people. Yeah. And, you know, I kind of lost touch since then. Um, you know, I don't think it's an acceptable answer for people to say I grew out of it because during the Attitude Era, the people that were most tuned into it were the adults, you know, yeah, in that, in that sure. 25, 34 range and all that. So I don't think, I think that's a little bit of a cop out. Of course, you talk about, the company going public and, and putting a PG rating on things, um, that's certainly going to limit your audience as well, especially when you guys were kind of the one-stop shop for more or less that 
rated R PG 13 kind of content, you get away from why people are coming to you. Yeah. They're going to look somewhere else to, to kind of fill that void. But yeah. you know, I, I don't know. I, you, you'll see it all the time and you'll see the big stars say this too, but you know, I think sometimes people get too carried away and focusing on the, on the wrestling and the spots and not the character development and focusing on the, the mainstream, um, you know, markets. I think there's a lot of things that WWE does to focus on these things that maybe the, the internet crowd doesn't understand. And they just, you know, pretty much crap all over from the start, but you know, that's kind of the, the glory of professional wrestling is you can have somebody to fill every gap and you can have your mainstream guys and you can have your, you know, guys for the internet crowds. And I just think it hasn't been a as diverse and, and wide range to kind of capture those markets. You know, you got all the big guys out there wanting to go and do these, you know, top rope high spots and pretty much work exactly like the small guys. Well, now nothing special for nobody. And it's just now we're watching the same thing. You know, I know, you know, I, I like to pick the brains of people that, that don't watch often, like my buddies that would come to see me work just to see me and, you know, had no idea what they were getting into. But, you know, it's just you see these big guys, they're not acting like big guys. You see these small guys, they're acting like big guys. And it's just <laughs> the story doesn't translate to the transient fan. So right. it just doesn't make sense. And when you get these people, you might only have you know, one shot of it. Someone might watch Total Divas or, or Miz and Miss, Misses and they, you know, might say, you know what, let me give wrestling a shot again. And we might only have a 10 second window, you know, to, to get them yeah. back. And they, yeah. they see something that doesn't make sense. It's like, all right, man, I'll wait another 10 years before I give this a shot again. Yeah, so. it sucks. It's funny. I, uh, on my XM show, I'm constantly trying to get my co-host Misha Tate UFC fighter. Um, she's a badass. She's a trailblazer. She just cannot get into it where I'm like, I'm always trying to sell her on it. And she's just like, mm, not for me, not for me. I mean, I, I think I'm still going to work on it and get her there. Um, but yeah, it can be really difficult to try to get people that haven't watched it for a long time or people that have a certain expectation of what they want. Or like you said, you turn on for those like 10 seconds and something's happening that you're just not into. But I do feel like if you gave a show your full attention, you'd find something within that show that you would become a fan of because there really is a little bit of something for everybody. Absolutely. And I think step one is always just going to a live event. So I feel like if you took Misha, mm -hmm. you know, kind of ringside and sat with her and kind of walked her through what she was looking at, she would stop to, you know, really appreciate the subtle nuances. Like, you know, for example, when I'd have my football buddies come, they, they'd expect like a show, like we're a circus, like we're clowns almost, you know, like I'm here to be entertained. But once they see what goes into it, it absolutely blows their mind. And I can certainly understand that stance for people in the, you know, UFC or, you know, combat sports, collision sports to, want to have that approach but it's like all right well imagine being roundhouse kick in the face when you know it's actually coming <laughs> yeah. that sucks when you get up and you know the second you're turning around you're getting blasted for real that's way worse than just taking a shot <laughs> not knowing it's coming that's number one then when you hear like the time cues that go into a match and we how we have to hit our times and how the ref has a microphone and he's kind of filling us in in real time what the coaches are saying in the back, how our promos have to be adjusted. Shoot, having a script, a two-page script slapped in your hand literally yep. 15 seconds before your music hits and somehow you're supposed to memorize this whole thing. It's and nuts. if you screw up one word, you're either fired or you're <laughs> magically off TV for six months to a year. Like when you start to tell someone oh this, it's God. like, my goodness, like, how do you, how do you do all this? And that's actually our pitch when we're selling, you know, our guys for, for brand deals with Paragon. Yeah. It's like, you couldn't come up with something that would catch our guys <laughs> off guard because so true. We've we can handle it. anything. <laughs> um, okay. So you mentioned having some of your football friends at events. Of course, that leads me into Gronkowski and this, this, uh, I, I hadn't even thought about this really until you just said that I was like, Oh my God. That moment at WrestleMania when Gronk jumped the barricade and Lisa, our security guard, thought he was just a fan jumping the guardrail. What happened there from his point of view through you? 
<laughs> well, Rob's already going into WrestleMania with his first ever in-ring appearance. So I don't care if you won a thousand Super Bowls and hosted 10,000 award shows, nothing prepares you for this level of entertainment. So he's already kind of buzzing, uh, you know, trying to figure things out. In rehearsals, we tried hard to limit as many people as possible to who actually knew what was coming. And somehow no one buzzed security. So <laughs> we get to the oh spot and I'm laying on the ground selling and Rob steps over and Lisa comes charging up. And you know, Lisa. She got his ass. <laughs> jacked his ass up. And I know Rob. So I saw Rob's face when it happened. And I was like, he has no idea what to do right now. That is his legitimate, confused, shock face. Not trying to sell. Like, he is kind of panicking right now because oh he God. can't pivot like we're trained to pivot. So <laughs> yeah. I'm on the ground covering my face, selling like, hey, part of the show. Part of, let him go. Part of the show. Lisa, he's good. <laughs> and I remember Tony, the other security guard, <laughs> runs up and he sees this and he's just like, what the f <laughs> he screamed it out i was dying i was trying so hard not to let anyone see my face oh but my God. it actually worked out better because you know how the hardcore fans are when they say see mainstream people they typically boo them so when they showed rob in the beginning you know there was kind of a mixed reception here um of course it wasn't in new england that would have helped but uh <laughs> You know, when we finally got to the spot and Lisa took it away, now all the people that may have wanted to boo a, th a third party person or outsider, they just wanted to see the spot. So they <laughs> actually all got on board. So it actually built the oh spot even God. better. And we got to right where we needed to be. And it just made the whole thing even better. Who did he take out? Gender? Gender, yeah. It was. Oh my God. That's so funny. I totally forgot about that. Just as you were talking about like friends at shows, I was like, oh my God, that moment with Lisa was, I remember watching from one of the monitors. I'm like, oh my God, she doesn't know he's part of the show. <laughs> oh, so funny. I love that. She um, was worried she was going to get fired after that. Oh, she's just the sweetest. I loved her so much. I wish that she was still there. I mean, not that it matters because I'm not there, but I love her so much. She was like such a badass. Speaking of which, that's why we got to give these, you know, security guards credit because people are so quick to bury security when someone slides into the ring and, and tackles Bret Hart or tackles yeah. Seth Rollins. And it's like, they don't know. They're not always up to speed, even when it's supposed mm -hmm. to happen. So there's, you know, always that little moment, you know, how do I handle this? Cause that could have been worse. Like if she would have injured Gromp or sprayed him with pepper spray, Imagine she like tasered him or something and ruined his career. Like then what, you know? So there's, oh my you God. gotta give those guys credit. The Bret Hart one was crazy because Graves and I were hosting Hall of Fame that year. And I remember that in like slow motion. We're in Brooklyn, we're at Barclays. Graves and I are on like the other side of the arena. The stage was center where they were doing all the hosting from. And I just saw this guy come hauling ass down the hallway or like down the aisle way between all the seats and whatnot. And I'm like, this guy's coming in. He is going to make it into the ring. And it, it, it felt slow motion to me, but I know for anyone to actually get up and like react to that of like, what's going on? Who is this person? But for that dude to like make it into the ring, take down Brett, take down Natty. Boots laid into him from all the guys that swarmed the ring after that. But like, holy shit, what a moment. I Ooh. saw that guy. He ran right next to me. I was on the, the aisle seat. I could have just put my arm out and touched that guy. I saw him sprint down. And I started chuckling. I thought it was part of the show. I was like, oh, he's, he's going to tap him out. He's going to submit the hell out of this yeah, guy during his speech. Here comes a sharpshooter. Right? I was like, this is going to be awesome. And then that happened. I was like, oh, my goodness. I felt kind of bad. You know, of course, heat of the moment, the guy came from behind me. So it's not like I would have really had too much time to right. step up and tackle him or whatever. But, yeah, just crazy how those situations happen. What can oh you do? God. I know. Yeah, it was so crazy. I remember Graves and I having to do like an on cam afterwards and like no selling it. The member Spud got up and like cut his promo. <laughs> yes. Yeah, 
Oh my God. What, what a bizarre world. It's so crazy. Uh, these moments that happen. Um, okay. More wrestling things. You are the most energetic, biggest baby face. Everyone loves some mojo. Why did they want to turn you heel? Um, I think they wanted a change of pace. Um, I think Vince always saw me as a heel, no matter what. I think that was just kind of where his mind went when he was looking at who I am, how I act, how I work, the physicality with it. So I think that was just something that was bound to happen. Mm -hmm. I wasn't resistant to it in the beginning. I thought it'd be fun. I thought it'd be different. I had my first ever match as a heel in a pay-per-view with Zach. I think it was the Clash of Champions when I turned on him. So I was like, man, that, that was kind of nerve wracking too. I didn't even have yeah. any practice runs at this thing. I was a baby face, literally my, my whole career. And then, you know, that happened. But uh, yeah, it was just kind of an interesting situation. Um, I know they wanted to get me away from the stay hype thing, which I really didn't want to do. I mean, that's been like kind of, my life's mantra. It's been something I really believed in. Um, and I always was kind of upset at the fact that somehow, and maybe, maybe this was my fault. Uh, I certainly didn't mean for this to happen, but stay hyped became a thing about just always being excited, always being loud and kind of obnoxious, but either way, having a good time. And that was never really supposed to be it. That was supposed to be a very minor aspect um stay hyped was supposed to be pretty much everything that you talked about is just always being on never resting never having off days off moments always doing ten thousand things at once you know it was like all more the motivational right and that's what i wanted it to be you know this guy that was you know playing football while getting a business degree while being a mentor on the team while being on the executive board of the business school and the leadership program you know to to wrestling everything i was doing there to being the only guy that was you know flying home on these red eyes after a uh, la raw landing on no sleep and going straight to the performance center seeing the weekly records that all the nxt guys put up in the weight room breaking literally every single one of them then getting back in the ring for a three-hour practice, then going to hot yoga, then going to a two-hour film study, then going to a two-hour massage session, you know, not because it feels good. It actually felt awful. Those things hurt when you're doing them right. Yeah. Then sleeping for three hours after five days, five cities, you know, five shows and all that, and waking up and doing it all again. That was, Stay Hyped was supposed to be this attitude of just always going and, you know, no matter wins, losses, whatever it is, you'll never take my smile from you, never take my energy from me. We're always coming back for more. And that was kind of the character I felt like could motivate people, that people could get behind, you know, that I could get on a mic and just do my thing. Not once in my career did I ever get the mic to, to cut a promo that, that I wrote, that, that I was able to get behind and wing. Not once in my career did I have a storyline where someone where we could have multiple matches and go back and forth and, and build a story it was always just always excited, loud, obnoxious mojo who never shuts the hell up and does quick, short matches because he's the hype guy. We don't need much time out of him. And then we'll use him for the community service PR side of it. And that was where I got pigeonholed, you know, and it was just yeah. like. It was frustrating for me because it started to compromise my self-worth. I was like, man, I feel like I'm just capable of so much more. I'm working so hard and I just have no opportunity to show what I'm working on. And it was just like, you know, honestly, that that release, probably the, the best thing that could have happened for me at that time. What was your relationship with Vince like? Because I feel like if Vince really got to know you and understand where you come from, understand your education, your business acumen, like all of that stuff. I feel like that would have had him seeing you in a different light and wanting to use you for so many different things. Did you have much of a relationship with him? I probably met with Vince on average, maybe quarterly. And uh, we always had a great relationship. Don't get me wrong. We always got along. We, we joke around, you know, I wasn't one of these guys that would go, 
hang out in his office for like an hour and really talk about nothing. Um, <laughs> but we always had like a, a good relationship. Uh, and I think he always saw me in one particular role in the company, but it seemed like it got to be the same kind of ebb and flow. Um, I would go have a conversation with him and kind of let him in on like just a small fraction of what I thought I could do. Um, you know, I'm talking like a five, 10 minute combo. You never want to take too much of Vince's time because understandably yeah. so he's, he's so busy, but he would hear like one thing and he'd be like, you're right. I like this. Nobody else on my roster can fit this role, you know, and I always pitch things that only I could do no matter how hard anyone else tried. Cause I knew they might just give it to that guy. So, um, yeah. he would, he would take it and I'd do like a main event run for like one to three months, you know, let's iron out some kinks. Let's put a new spin on this character. And then we're going to give you a run. And the runs would last anywhere from like one week when I st did the stupid face paint thing to like a month or two. And then somehow when it came time to actually have the run, not just set up the run with get over matches, things just Done. ended. And then it was back to, all right, here I'm in this lull again. Let's rinse and repeat. And like every year it seemed to be this new little, new little wrinkle. And, and we'd go from there and it just used to kind of drive me crazy. Cause it was like, we have some guys that play major characters and major personalities on television that in real life have the personality of a rock, not the rock, <laughs> like a rock. It's like, shoot, man, you guys can't find something for me. Are you kidding me right now? Like whether I pitch it or you come up with it, I don't care. Give me something. Let me sink my yeah. teeth into something. It was it's, so, it frustrating. so frustrating because there are, I mean, whether, you know, you know, there's such a scale of what people bring to the table, but I mean, you look at the roster there and it's like, there's so many people that are so talented that just never really got that opportunity or yeah, never got the thing to like really sink their teeth into in that I think is such a thing that really brings down moral because there's nothing more upsetting than feeling like you're not living up to your potential. That's like the most gutting thing. You're like, I'm telling you, give me the ball. Let me run with it. Give me that brass ring. Let's do the thing. But yeah, it can be, it can just be so frustrating. And there's so many people that I know have felt that, that have been dying to, to really take these opportunities and make the most from them. And yeah, it, it just sucks to see people sort of flounder in that, like in between you're, you're just so dependent on the creative team, giving you the thing that you want or trying to get those times with Vince that can be so hard to just like actually get in to see him and make these pitches. Yeah, it was crazy. And it's just, for me, it's just like, it's a three hour show. Like we can't find a way to work everybody in. I mean, shoot, even if it's just something as small as someone standing in the background in character of someone else's promo yeah. or, or something, it's like, I, you just, you always kind of see the same guys doing the same stuff and you know, the, the fans don't appreciate. It. And I understand you, you have a lot of star power and you're trying to get ratings and now you're in a ratings war with AEW and, and everything. But it was just like, there's gotta be a way to, to work everybody in creatively half my pitch has yeah. always involved me losing because it's like you always need people to lose and For if sure. i can find a way to get over by losing you, you need somebody to, yeah. to plug into that spot i mean who cares at the end of the day i mean i had like i remember at one point i had like the best win loss percentage in wwe like one of them all time and it was just like yeah that's cool but it's always like small get over matches that that don't matter like i'm I don't care about that part. Obviously winning and losing ain't always the key to success here. So it was like, shoot, give me some L's. Let me oh put a wrinkle gosh. on some things and whatever. Well, Mojo, I know I don't have a ton of time with you because you're a busy man and you've got to go to TMZ really quickly, but I wanted to touch on our trips over to Saudi Arabia. So your father is Palestinian and your mom's half Syrian, correct? Yes. And then you have family that's over in Saudi Arabia. I got to go on one of those trips with you and we all went out like shopping at like two in the morning, which was awesome. Um, what were those trips like for you to get to go to Saudi Arabia? And like you, you mentioned earlier, like still brushing up on your Arabic and being able to speak the language. What were those trips like for you? I probably enjoyed those trips more than uh, anyone on the roster. Maybe Mans M Mansoor with me. Um, yeah. Though, those were cool. I remember, I think we did a live event over there before we signed like the big Saudi deal. 
And that was the first time I got to see cousins and uncles and aunts of mine meet uh, nieces and nephews, um, but see some of these people for the first time since I was like five years old, you know? Yeah. So going over and being able to see family was just incredible. And especially as like someone with an Arab background growing up in the States, you don't see any of that culture here. You know, you're American and that's, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm a, I, I say I'm American. I'm born and raised here, but um you know, you don't, you don't really get to see your family. You don't really get to see the architecture and the culture and, and hear the language authentically. So going over was always the best experience for me. The, the food there is, Oh I mean, my that God. Oh, that catering spread was unbelievable. I was just talking to Lita about that. I was messaging her. I was like, girl, enjoy that spread. It's amazing. Second to none. And yeah. I'm biased. Of course, it's my favorite type of food, but <laughs> just everything about it, like the luxurious hotels we would stay in and everything was just, yeah. this was a vacation for me, you know? Um, <laughs> and then they always sent me over a week or two before or after to do like the media run and the meet and greets and the community service outreach stuff, uh, which was always a, a blessing for me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I loved every second of it. I mean, I would have loved to have gone every month or every quarter. Yeah. Get my miles up too. <laughs> I know, honestly, right? Damn, those flights over are like, woohoo! It's a long plane ride, but it is so cool when you when you get there. And I always think it's cool. Just you know, that was one of the best parts of being in WW is being able to experience different cultures, experience different ways of living. Um, just the tr the travel aspect of it was so so cool. I, I will always be able to look back on those times. And yeah, I mean, us going to Saudi Arabia is like what me, you, Natty, Alexa, <laughs> who else was with us? Was there anyone else with us? I feel like I'm missing somebody. I remember that iconic photo we took. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the group of us, that was the best. I'm trying to remember who else was on that shopping excursion we did. That Mickey well, was there. Mickey, oh yes, Mickey was with us. Maybe that's what it was. Maybe that's who all it was. I, I know yeah. we had some sort of like uh, security with us. Yeah. I can't remember who per se, but that was fun. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. It was super fun. Um, well, listen, I could ask you a million more questions because honestly, I had so much stuff written down for us to talk about, but um, we only have so much time and I know you're busy. You've got to go uh, jump on TMZ right now. So maybe we'll have to have a second parter at some point. I'm in anytime. Sweet. This is Hell the best. Yeah. I love chatting with you. And now I have to say my bit about you. <gasps> Everything you've been doing has been absolutely incredible. I think for you to occupy so many different platforms and so many different industries since WWE just goes miles to, to demonstrate your, your integrity and just your worth and your value and how much you have to offer just so many, so many different industries. It's just incredible to see. I think this pod has been incredible with just the guests that you brought on from every different walk of life and everybody telling an incredible story. And I've heard from a lot of top executives with some of these brands we've done deals with just about how incredible you are in this role of Aww. having conversations, having people feel comfortable, opening up, talking about the interesting uh, topics, being respectful, everything about it. And I think just as it relates to everything we've talked about this far, just showing the world outside of just the wrestling bubble, what we're about and what we're what we can do. You are just the spokeswoman for this. Uh, one of the most <laughs> iconic people we could possibly have represent the business as a thank whole. Thank you. And for this, I give you my full heartfelt thanks. My guy, thank you so much. And if you could just do me a huge favor and stop beating my ass in our sleeper <laughs> basketball fantasy group. That would be great. I know you keep saying I'm really nice. You don't want to squash me, but here we are. Me at the very, very bottom of that list. So we still have things to work on. You know, there's lots of things to still work on in the future. <laughs> Way more to come. <laughs> All right. I'll talk to you later, dude. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me on. Bye. Bye.